Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. show today, Karen and Joe Sutton, Joe Howe. So these guys are the founder of a system called Penny Drops, and they discover the full money mindsets. This is something we're going to talk about. Um, so on the show, we mostly have embodiment teachers, but I want a kind of personal mission, really, to help embodiment teachers get their shit together around money and business. Uh, most of us are horrible at it. I was and have sort of at least become mediocre now. And I realized there's just a huge amount that we as a community can learn um, that's why we've had people like you know George Cow and Ted Hargraves, marketing for hippies on. <clears throat> it's also they're more like the external side of things, you know, marketing and different ethical marketing techniques. But I've realised there's an internal side of things too. And these guys have come highly recommended to me. We've had, we've had a chat once, and I like what I've heard, so we've got them on the show. So guys, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Be nice to hear a little bit about your story. So sort of in brief, how did you become interested? Normally I say in the body, but I'm going to say in money for you guys. I'll tell you, it is an interesting thing. All my life for me, I've been completely obsessed with what makes some people have loads of money and what makes a whole load of the rest of us have very, very little. And I think a lot of that came from my background, Mark. Um, my dad came from one of the richest families in Ireland. Oh. And I'm not talking like a Mac mansion and a few nice cars. I'm talking my cousin is regularly in the rich list. Properly rich family. And my mum came from an absolutely dirt poor family in County Limerick. Wow. Her father was a wood turner and she married my dad for money, essentially. And what was fascinating as I was growing up, I saw that there was such a difference in how the rich bunch and the poor bunch handled money. Yeah. And financial catastrophe befell both with all sorts of regularity. And the rich guys always came out on top. Yeah, they, they just seemed yeah. to knew, they knew what to do. They took risks, they nearly lost their houses, they did all kinds of things happened. And they always came out, they bounced back, they absolutely knew what to do. The poor side of the family had money come in, you know, bits of inheritances, bits of windfalls, all sorts of things happened. And they always ended up dirt poor. Uh -huh. And I started to see then when I was about seven or eight, my dad's business collapsed and we had to leave our home. And I think, to be honest, I was really traumatised from that. Uh -huh. But I started to see how somebody from one background weathered it and somebody else would just go to pieces. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just drove me all my life to understand it. Um, it drove my career. I went into, I'm a trainer by trade. Um, but my obsession was like, what makes people really good at something and what makes people really shit at something? And my master's degree is in um, competencies and capability frameworks. So I would go into like the International Stock Exchange or I did an awful lot of work with the legal services and the legal profession. That what makes somebody, what are the capabilities and competencies that make somebody a really top lawyer, an average lawyer, or a really, really bottom performing? And we've applied that to money. What makes somebody way above averagely financially successful? What makes them averagely financially successful and below? And Joe, hmm. your background is very similar. There was a lot of similarities, isn't there? Oh, that's right, yeah. My parents came to this country 60 years ago and settled in one of the poorest wards in the country in Derby. And they actually started a small little business. So from scratch, the ground up, without any qualifications or money or to be honest with you many resources they actually started a business so i was born into a business family i've only ever worked in making my and um, had earned my income from growing businesses and what happened in 2004 karen and i got together already and we decided right we're going to start from scratch so we started from scratch with where we were because i've had two older children in derby and started from scratch building businesses again that, that's had nothing to do with a family business, but just from zero, ground zero. And we built a total of three businesses and we became financially free in 2012. 
and this is the business, this is the training business that we're, we're speaking about. Does that mean, sorry, financially free? What, what um, financially yeah. free is is an interesting thing for us because we're not flashy people or, you know, drive around in massive cars or anything. But if we stopped working this minute, we can still pay the school fees. We can still live in our nice house and we can still have a very nice life. So um, you you're not dependent upon future earnings to... In any way. In want. any way. Our assets... <laughs> Would support would see us out nicely. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so what made you start the sort of money mindset stuff? I mean, what was there a particular moment? You said you yeah. don't need to do it financially. Well, what made you go? Okay, we want to actually work on this, but to help other people. Do you know? I, and again, we didn't actually set out to discover the four money mindsets. What happened was back in two thousand and eight, after the financial crash. Um. I had said to Joe, look, because we were getting a little bit of money through in the businesses by then, and I had a little bit of space to pursue some other interests. I said, right, I want to become a debt advisor. And this was driven unconsciously by my own trauma from what happened when I was a kid and my dad's business collapsed. And I had some sort of misguided idea that I could go out there and help people, particularly other kids, not suffer what I had as a kid. And I went off, did my training, and I was working in Derby in 2008, 2009 as a debt counsellor. In, I'd go to people's houses, get all the stuff together, get all the shit together and find out, right, this is how much debt you're in. We contact the people you owe money to, we negotiate, we sort you out and everything is fine. And I must be a bit slow in a way because what I was noticing was that they were in debt, and the rest of their family would be in debt. And then they'd ask me to help their cousins and their nephews. And the whole lot of them were in debt. And then I think the, the, the kind of crux of it came was, I was called to this house in Derby, this, um, in Little Over, and there was an old man and an old lady. And they were crying when I got to the house, because very often people who are in debt, the people they owe money to come to the house and do things right. and intimidate them. So the pair of them were crying in the house and I went in and I was absolutely delighted with myself when I'd sorted out. A well-known bank had actually lent them 12 grand and was hassling them and all sorts of things. Anyway, I'd sorted that out. And six months later, the guy phoned me up and he said, look, I'm back in debt again. Right. And I, I nearly, you should have heard the swearing. Luckily, I didn't swear like that down the phone at him, but I was effing and blinding like only a mad cork woman can around the house and then it dawned on me that this is my baggage this was how this guy did his money this you know he didn't actually understand how to do his money and yeah did. yeah so you'd sort of put a sticking plaster on top of it but the actual let, let me kind I of made it back. worse i think yeah <laughs> That makes sense and i you know you do see these kind of patterns people listen to this they might say hey people are rich and poor either because of luck because of uh, oppression, you know, a sort of Marxist yeah. might say, hey, you know, the rich are rich, you know, because you know, they, uh, they, not because they have a different mindset, but because they have power, they have certain opportunities, education. And then other people would say, well, it's just some people are talented and some people aren't, and combined with a bit of luck, that's how it all balances out. So, you know, what would you say to anyone that sort of pushes back against the sort of, the sort of psychological side of this? You know, I wouldn't for... A nanosecond decry that some people have it a lot easier than others to start with, or anything like that. But what you do see in the mindsets and, and is when somebody is in a space where they understand on an embodied level that they are responsible for their own financial success, and somebody else not for any other reason than this is how they've grown up and this is what they've absorbed yeah. around them truly believes that somebody else or something else is responsible for their financial success yeah. the outcomes are hugely different sure. and there's a difference between responsibility and blame because it is no one's fault if they're in a terrible financial position but when you find yourself in any kind of a financial position or any position really when you understand it's your responsibility to do something about it yeah the outcome is completely different yeah, and this is what I say to my students who are around embodiment and around trauma. I say, listen, you're not to blame 
that you're yeah. in a bad mood, but you are responsible. If you want to take responsibility, you can change your mood. You know, you're you're yeah. not blame for your trauma. And if you want to take responsibility for it, there are things you can do about it. And that is quite a big shift. And without that shift, people are in the victim mode where it's very it's very difficult to get ahead on anything, whether it be money or embodiment or anything else, because uh, like they're being done to by the world. That's so. Right. So while we're not victim blaming, there is this frame of responsibility here, right? Of saying, okay, I'm going to unearth some of my patterns around money, which are deep embodied cultural patterns. Like some of the things we've talked about this a little bit before, like I come from an Irish family, there's certain things there. And Joe's from a, a Sikh family and there's a different, you know, thing, set of mm-hmm. things there. Yes. So what do you think are some of the most common patterns that you see then? The interesting patterns that we see is that when we went out to look at the money mindsets, there are the four money mindsets. So there's a mindset to be in debt for sure. But when we researched it, there's a mindset to break even. And it it does what it says on the tin. Somebody with that money mindset will break even. A comfortable money mindset or saving money mindset is a very specific mindset where people save money and then they spend And a rich money mindset is hugely different again. Um, And what is an interesting thing is some cultures do seem to have, and I don't want to say something broad brush or, you know what I mean, too much or anything like that, but certain cultures really do understand that they are responsible for their financial success. Uh Uh So when I see my mother-in-law coming from Northern India, not only, like Joe says, she didn't... um, have you know money or, or or anything she didn't even speak the language um but she had and her husband had this huge concept of no one is coming in to rescue me so i've got to be responsible for making this successful do you know what i mean so you see in some immigrant cultures cultural patterns, cultural yeah. Patterns. yeah you see that in, i've seen a difference in different kinds of immigrant like irish immigrant family i'm from yeah. You know, American Irish immigrants, it can be different from people that stayed, you know, back in the old country, as it were. It can, yeah. It's definitely cultural differences I've seen in Russia and Israel and places I've yeah. worked quite extensively. And some places it seems like there is more of a push towards it, a self-responsibility towards it. Some places more of a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Like yeah. in Russia, there's often this feeling like it's not enough money, That's you know, right. and then even when people are quite rich, they can have that as a mindset that seems to be completely independent from how much money they actually have in the bank. Yeah. It's, it's, so we're not talking about poor people saying there's not enough money because it's like, okay, you can say, well, that person's just poor. They're realistic. Mm. But when it's, when it's someone who's rich and has that mindset, I go, well, something's up here. You know, you're a millionaire right. and you still, you won't buy your friend a coffee. Yeah. Come on. You know, like, what's going on? Something, something's up there. Do you know what I mean? That's right. That's right. And you you even see the thing I remember. And again, I don't want to get sued for political incorrectness or anything. But, you know, uh, like, if you went to Holland, like for argument's sake, um, and you see the difference between people from the north and the south of Holland. And that's a very Protestant Catholic thing where uh, you go uh, to the Catholic south and they would give you the coat off their back. And like I remember, like, and you know, it's, well, we'll say it's not quite like that. That, you know, that they're, <laughs> that they're careful. <laughs> Listen, all I'll say is the last two times I've used Dutch suppliers, it's come in a more, ex- both times it came in more expensive than was agreed originally. That's all I'm saying, you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> so but, you know, like, and then, then I know one Dutch lady, um, oh my God, and she's the most generous, fabulous person. Do you know? Sure, yeah. there, are, there are patterns and we shouldn't yeah. generalise totally, yeah. but yeah. it would be unrealistic to say there aren't patterns amongst certain groups. Or as a Chinese comedian I was listening to the other day saying that in China, ha- the, instead of saying Happy New Year, the phrase in Chinese in Mandarin Cantonese is, I hope you get rich. And yeah. that's their go-to yeah. phrase for Happy New yeah. Year. So, I mean, that says something, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, and they have the, mo- fa- the Chinese people have the most fabulous, comfortable and rich money mindsets. And when we did our research for these mindsets, we spoke to lots of, yeah, was Chinese people, Indian people, you know, those people who actually, right, yeah. from yeah. nothing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so go through those mindsets again. How would people listening to this spot it, you know, if they had a yeah. hobby mind? What were they again? So, say them one oh, Right, yeah. Now, we've got the four money mindsets. So we've got an in-debt money mindset. And it's all seen... In, you can see a top line in the financial behaviours. Uh-huh. So think of it this way. When your money comes in, 
I don't know how often it comes in, once a month, once a week, whatever. Let's, we're just going to say once a month. When your money comes in, does it straight away go to service consumer debt? If some of it goes straight away to service consumer debt, that's an in-debt money mindset. What, did, so what does that mean, service? And service consumer debt, debt means if you've got credit cards. Okay. Car- I about my overdraft. Yeah. So for a yeah. long time, I was always in my overdraft. When yeah. money came in, the first £2,000 was always just eaten by the overdraft. Yeah. Because I was Stopped always away. in my overdraft. Yeah. 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 So okay. it's already spent before it soon as okay. it so it's already, you've already counted for it. Yeah. I'm just getting Spot back on. to zero. Yeah. Point, yeah. Spot yeah. on. Spawn on. And when I was a debt advisor, you'd see a lot of that. Now, it's interesting, a, a, a break-even money mindset, exactly what it says on the tin. The money comes in and it's allocated. Okay, and right. if they can room. save a little bit towards the end, they will, yeah. but it always goes on something over a yeah. year or so, yeah? yeah. So, yeah. But the, and the, the, well, how you'd see the pattern there, Mark, is the money comes in, allocated, it's all spent, and then a tiny bit at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's not much joy in that for really. So it's just no, so I mean, you can feel like they never work. get ahead. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay, I've been there too, actually. So, yeah, okay, so that feeling of like I'm making ends me, I'm just, I'm not really going anywhere. I'm not really saving anything. I'm not really investing anything. Yeah. But surely some of this is just an external reality as well, right? I mean, for someone in a certain wage, for a certain job, you know, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. It's a bit different for me, but someone who's a nurse who lives in Brighton, that's yes. a set salary for the NHS. Yeah. And there's a set sort of standard rent of, say, a two-bedroom apartment in Brighton. I mean, isn't there just a reality there as well as a mindset? The thing is there isn't. Um, and, and I'm not saying that the reality isn't X amount of money that comes in for you, but if, for argument's sake, you have a nurse in Brighton yeah. who has a comfortable money mindset, not the break even, right? They've yeah. got a comfortable. Sure as anything, they'll be having the one bedroomed, up, and it'll be a bit of a grotty one, and they will save. And the pattern you'll see for a comfortable okay. money mindset oh, yeah. is as soon as the money hits the account, they save a portion and then they spend the rest. And so they're putting aside something. Mm. Okay, so I not that long ago got to this point. So I noticed when I was – actually, I, I said this to you guys before. I don't mind sharing it out there because people often say, Mark, you're amazing with business and money. I'm like, I weren't always. I mean, for the first five years of my business, first three years of the business were tough. But after three years, we started doing quite well. I started making money. And I remember after five or six years, I went to my um, – uh, was it business advisor? And she said, yeah. Oh, why don't you put some money aside for that? And that I said, Oh, I'm always in my overdraft. And she said, Well, why? You earn pretty good money. And I was on about 40,000 a year or something, you know, yeah. but I was always going back to my overdraft. And then eventually I got to a place where I was able to sort of at least break even. When I got married, I decided, Right, no more debt. It's like overnight I shifted out of debt mindset. So I'm not going to get in debt because I'm getting married. And I really made a firm choice that I wouldn't make my wife inherit my debt. That didn't seem fair. Mm. So I got to more of like a break-even point. My wife claims she's lucky with money. I think she's grown up in a family where she has a very different mindset. She's grown relatively wealthy. And um, I've just the last couple of years, I've started putting money aside. So money will come in and I'll go, right, we, we had 50K come in from a big um, sale a while back. And I went, right, 10K, I'm going to put into Bitcoin and an account and I'm going to look into some shares and, okay, let's put that aside. And then I spend the money. So yeah. is that like I've shifted? And, uh, yeah, world. that's a comfortable money mindset. Okay. And they will save first before they spend anything. And it doesn't matter. that that That's what made, you know, like makes an immigrant buy a sewing machine, even when they're living on absolutely sod all. They yeah. know if I can get the money together to do that, I can make more. Uh-huh, um, right. I'm going to save yeah. money. That's an investment. Yeah. You know, rather than I'm going to keep renting, I'm going to put money aside and in 10 years, exactly. I'm going to be able to buy a little yeah. house. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what I did. I came to London in 1989 and within four years, I owned my own flat outright. And I came with 17 quid for the first while I was sleeping on floors. Um, but I, ha- I, ca- I had some drive and I did understand if I don't sort myself out to have a bit of collateral, I'm going nowhere. Funnily enough, once I had the first one bedroom flat, I was able to borrow to buy a big place to convert into a block and I was able to do different things. Now, that's a rich money mindset where every penny that comes in, yeah. Joe and I are a bit like this at the moment where... As soon as money comes into us, we decide, okay, how do we leverage this money? This so money needs to make more money now. Yeah. So, so the mindset moves from 
okay, I've got a thousand pounds, say. I yes. can, so the comfortable is like, I can save that. That's right. But the rich mindset is, okay, what is the asset here? So yeah. for example, one of the things I looked at was like, okay, I could put it into an account, but then the interest is lower than inflation. So that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Or I can invest it in this part of my business and that's likely to have a better return. Spot on. And particularly if in your business, you focus on growing assets. Because this is another yeah. thing we see about people with the poorer money mindsets. They're not brought up to understand that you're nowhere without assets. They are the only game in town. Right. I was speaking to someone who uh, had just inherited a house um, and they had a house of their own and they were yeah. going to sell it. And I said, listen, don't sell it, rent it. Do you want the do you want the cow or do you want the milk? Yeah. And they said, the milk. Yeah. And I went, no, wrong answer. Like, like, but and this person was not unsuccessful or poor, but they still had the mindset of thinking, get the thing now, yeah. not the asset, not the thing that's gonna keep that's right. making money. Like we might even have to go back to basics, like what's an asset for people? That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And for people, we I mean we grow up not understanding what assets are like often people will think their own home is an asset but their own home is usually a liability because an asset is something that systematically puts money in your pocket right yeah um and you can build assets from yourself from the ground up or you can buy assets but they are something that systematically pays you. And income follows assets. It is the only game in town. Let me let me try and clarify that. I want to make it relevant because most people listening to this don't have, you know, portfolios of shares. Yeah, well. yeah, so, yeah. so my YouTube channel, which has ad revenue, that's yeah. an asset because every month I get a certain amount from YouTube that comes. That's to right. Me. That's right. Whereas what about my email list? Now that is not making money directly but it has the potential to make a lot of money. Like if I've got... That is a good asset. And think That's of it as asset. well. In there, it, it, it's probably an asset that probably keeps on giving in some ways because I bet you embedded in there, there is all sorts of information. Do you know what I mean? If it's a big enough list that you could segment and all kinds of sure, things, you sure. could it's really, really leverage. the system that you can actually make money from. Yeah. And that becomes an asset, a bit like a YouTube channel that something comes up every month, in effect, is actually whether you're showing up or not, it's going to come in, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. The YouTube channel is just, yeah. I could be sitting on a beach in Thailand and that would still yeah. come in. The email list I'd have to send an offer out to. Yeah. But, exactly. yes. break from the interview to tell you about our shop and a deal we've got on there and also about some events that are coming up so if you go to embodied facilitator slash shop and use the code use the code podcast podcast 50 podcast 50 podcast 50 is the code you can get 50 percent off 50 percent off anything in the shop and what have we got on there how to design training trauma for facilitators breath work leadership resilience uh, life purpose there's a bunch of books there's a bunch of e courses mostly for facilitators trainers coaches yogis different ebooks but that code will give you 50% out of anything at all there in the shop so that could save you let's see up to 100 pounds which is about 120 dollars so well worth having that code go to embodiedfacilitator.com slash shop also on that website you will see embodiedfacilitator.com slash events dash calendar just look under events under the main title you'll see all the stuff we've got coming up for events we regularly have free online events if you're interested in embodiment we have them on coaching life purpose marketing or trauma all sorts of things so have a look at the events page you can see the different one day events we've got coming up related to the conference and all kinds of other stuff okay so all of that is on embodiedfacilitator.com and remember that code there that code is podcast 50 if you want 50 percent off anything there you go a good deal back to the interview Joe, let's bring you in a little bit here as well, okay? Like, like I, it, the, I'm good interrupting there, by the way, as well. I'm from an Irish family. You have to yeah, learn to yeah, interrupt yeah. if you're going to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I've seen this dynamic before. So <laughs> listeners are going to be shocked. They're like, no, 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 matriarchal Irish culture. <laughs> what? How do people change their mindset? So I've sort of struggled. I've I kind of, I've identified some of this, like, listeners may sort of be putting themselves somewhere on there. You know, I, I feel like I go backwards and forwards some days. I'm 
investing other days i'm just trying to survive you know like what do we do about the money mindsets if we're and, and this is what we've been working on for years hence actually identifying the mindsets the first thing is is to know which mindset you're actually in because uh-huh. these play out habitually and subconsciously you make decisions you every single day on <laughs> on money uh, on what's a good financial decision you know uh so what we need to do is identify what it is and how we do that is we help people by well they come to us often with what would you say the top three problems to change it and that if you want to change your money mindset um yeah they come to us it's really helping people even identify what the problem is the top three problems people come to us with is they say um i haven't got enough money mm-hmm. and we're saying to them okay so you haven't got enough money one of you tried and they'll often say things like because our our clients are all small business people and we deem very mainstream small business people um and they say that they chase sales or they're um you know maybe borrowing or trying to get other money in like that they also say one of their problems is a constant cycle of worry mm-hmm. or even this kind of groundhog day that they're always in the same place financially and that's the mindset at work What's interesting about how we actually help them shift it is that initially when we were helping people we would help them with all the technical knowledge and understanding so we would say okay you need these amount of accounts you need to put this much in here every month this is what you need to understand about assets you know all the technical knowledge and understanding and within 2 months or 3 months they'd fall off the wagon and it would go back. it's not enough is it the same with marketing yeah. people can learn great marketing skills but embodiment wise if they're not able to embody generosity and being yeah. seen and being yeah. playful and all this listening and all the things that are needed for marketing they still can't do it it's just they've got a load of books telling them what they can't do you know exactly. so don't help yeah it's absolutely right and the more we went into this um we started to get into the world of embodiment and i've trained um as a trauma therapist i'm in my final year of advanced trauma therapy training and joe does a lot of embodiment work as well mm-hmm. and i've not done it to practice as a therapist even though i do have some therapy clients but we did it because we got to see the mindset is so deep in a way I think this the one the word the phrase mindset is bandied about and it's probably not even that helpful because it's not just a mindset it's, 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 so it's the whole deep. setup right it's the whole way yeah. of it it's yeah. just so deep yeah so so what we've had to do is get underneath the uh, the superficial symptoms and think what's the actual deeper problem and it boils down to it's this thing it's because it's money and you're human and the way we make um good financial decisions or don't because we work with so many people you have to actually have you have to have your thinking brain online also be aware of the actual the the emotional motivation that what causes the decisions because the mindset's in play as well and then we have to get to and say what's actually happening to the body brain in the the triune brain model we often start with that and saying saying look let's look at how you make good financial decisions just to sort of open up the mindset for someone because when people are in fear and reactivity that trauma traumatized fight flight mm. they can't plan long term you know i spoke to a financial advisor the other day i said listen we've got this conference coming up i don't know how it's going to go but it might go well i want to get a bit ahead of the curve on this so i said you know he said listen mark i plan for 5 years minimum you know for your for your future for 5 years do you, do you want to have that conversation and i was kind of surprised you know most businesses don't think more than a year ahead you know you like coaches you might have a contract for a 6 months maybe and this guy was like listen i want to work with you for 5 years you know as a financial advisor for you and i was like wow and if you're like in a tra- if you're in that sort of traumatic immediate threat hmm. you ain't thinking 5 years ahead you ain't thinking hmm. rationally it's all coming from i've got to get what i get now you know give me the milk not the cow It is and it can well and causes people to make them like it causes really bright people to make awful decisions. Yeah. So it, it, it's not even just the short termism or anything but repeatedly spending. Repeatedly money comes in and they have for some reason for something that hasn't yet come into their awareness they keep on getting rid of it. Right that's why I think it is I just kept getting rid of it. Yeah, I did get rid of it for years. Yeah. 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 
Or as soon as they get scared, the comfortable money mindset is probably one of the most uncomfortable places a human being can be from what we felt and worked with, with the people who work with us because it's it's fear-based and, and it's like people close down and hang on and they go to that anxiety place and start to hoard and they starve their businesses. Um, I've definitely seen that with people that just mm-hmm. cannot be comfortable. And it just seems like... I, I think I turned a corner when I got married and my wife says it's all her fault. I think she's been a good influence on me. But, um, you know, I just haven't worried about money in a few years. Now, I still think about my business a lot. I still think yeah. about, you know, make sure we make money and, okay, is there cash flow for the, you know, at the moment we're doing a crowdfunding for the conference, for example, and I've got to raise about £200,000 to make the conference happen. There's, there's a bit of anxiety there, but I'm not, like, worried about it. It's just yeah. part of my plan for the year. We make money, we borrow the money, we get gifted yeah. the money, whatever. I haven't worried about money in a few years, and even though now it's much bigger amounts of money flying out, I mean, you might, my mum couldn't bail me out if I screwed that one up. That's, that's, yeah. that's definitely the case. So I go, that's interesting. I'm not so worried about money now, even no. though the stakes are bigger. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's fantastic, Mark. And... Uh, some of the work when we we have these seven capabilities that we look at with people and one of them it's just interesting talking to you we explore how much people give their power to money and what it's sounding like from you is you've actually gotten to the place where you're comfortable enough with it you're not giving your power to money you're having a bit more control over it i haven't lost no it's nice sleep over money in at least three years that's absolutely fantastic. And the other one is the upskilling. The the real top 2% of financially successful people understand that as they get more money into the system, they're actually going to have to become better, not worse. When That's money. what I'm learning. <laughs> I right. learn about houses and gold prices and Bitcoin and stocks. And I'm having to learn all these things. There's a lot That's to right. learn, but I don't mind. I just feel like it... It yeah. comes with the territory. It's a nice problem to have. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've got and it keeps, on, it keeps on going because, like, if you, like, if any of us here were given a forty million pound business tomorrow morning, what yeah. would happen to it? We'd run it up on the rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We haven't upskilled enough. Like, it takes a lot different money skills to run a one million pound business or a ten million pound. It business. does. It, like, I'm running the conference now, and that's a bigger scale than you know my business before, which is like an eighty grand business. And the conference. Yeah. It's got a 400 grand, 500 grand budget. So yeah. it's sort of five times as big as the business I was running before. Yeah. And it's like, okay, new skills, new people, um, new colleagues, yeah. certain bringing yeah. people in. Yeah. Uh, different spending as well. Like I realized like, oh, I can spend money on say a copywriter for my website or get a new fancier web designer because the return makes it make sense. Okay. Whereas previously it wouldn't have made sense with the scale to have a copywriter. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing I've realized, tell me if this is where this fits on your spectrum is how precious my time is. Like, like, you know, this is for me, I've realized that I don't want to be spending people keep, I've had poorer friends of mine that I think have a poorer mindset who will say, don't spend money on that, do it yourself. Oh, I'm like, what, why would I do it myself <laughs> yeah. when I could, yeah. A, I don't want to, it's not my life purpose, but B, that's, if my time is several hundred pounds an hour, whatever it is, you know, like, that's crazy to not spend 50 quid an hour to have that done for me. Yeah, That's you want to be on track. Because yeah. you want to yeah. be focused yeah. on creating assets. And the upfront work is massive, but the reward is fantastic because it ends up buying you your time. Because that's right. what come in all the time, not earned income, which is which the majority of the population has set up to get a job. And then yes. when they're not working, they're working for themselves, in effect, being self-employed, but they carry on with the same mindset. Because when you, like, I spoke to my lawyer about this, so I've got a lawyer now, right? Nice bloke, does jiu-jitsu, good guy. He gets paid three hundred pounds an hour plus VAT, and I thought that's quite a lot of money. Mm. And I thought that this is the most I'm used to paying someone per hour. You know, I was a bit freaked out when we started paying him, but then it's very useful what he does now because we're at a scale where it makes sense. But then I realised this guy has to work really hard, and he's got a limited earning potential because he makes money per hour. That's Whereas I thought if I'm selling assets, I'm selling a course that can have a hundred people on, but it can yeah. have a thousand people on. Yeah. Or I'm writing a book and that book, you know, I've got a book now. My book makes me 10 pounds a day. Yeah. This book here, tenner every day yeah. into my bank account. Don't yeah, sound I'm... like much, but over a year, worth having. 
Yeah, as they say, that's better than a kick up the arse, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but because I'm not yeah. doing it, the book's written. Amazon's <laughs> selling it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, that's like, poof. Yeah. But that's what really pushback you get? I think, I think I'm sort of sold for you guys in this sort of stuff, and I'm really realising it's important, but what kind of pushback do you get here? Because people say, oh, you're, you know, you're part of the evil capitalist system, and you're supporting oppression, you know, you're just you know, helping rich people get richer. Like, what's the kind of pushback you generally might get from the more... Because my audience are pretty hippie, okay? Yeah. They're pretty alternative. Mm. What's, the, what's the pushback you might get? Yeah, um, I mean... You can sometimes when you're like we present to big audiences and you'll always look out into the audience and see a couple of people who were there and they have a face on them like a slap darts. <laughs> and you can tell and I think right. Well, I love having Irish people yeah, on the show. Yeah. <laughs> and you think, right, you know, there's somebody there and they're they're not in a good space with, <sighs> with somebody creating money. And I suppose when it comes to the sort of the partisan politics or anything like that of money creation. I've seen a lot of that because my dad and his background, you know, I mean, he went to the best public school, all the rest of it, all that family were like that. And they did have beliefs about poor people that there's no point divvying out the money because these people would, what did Boris Johnson say? Spaff it up the wall. (laughs) And I hated their... Um, I guess you saw the corruption as well. I oh, man, movement. I don't, if I even, or just know. with political parties, I yeah, mean, yeah. honest to God, I don't even start me on it. Yeah. It was shocking. And it absolutely it was one of the reasons I left Ireland, because I thought, I, I just don't want to be any part of this. But I'll tell you on the other side of it, my granny on the other side, the poor one was a communist. And she believed that every penny earned was from the sweat at the back of the working poor. Yeah. She was the nicest, most intelligent woman. And because her whole life she believed that her financial success was dictated by somebody else, she wasted her life and she achieved nothing much. She wants to screw it all over because people think it's a zero-sum game, don't they? That's they right. I make money, I take it from yeah. someone else. But that's not how money works, is it, when you look at No, it grows yeah. and it creates. And I'm so passionate about it. I mean... And the hard right and the hard left. I did degree a degree in history out of passion for politics, really, because yeah. I'm so yeah. passionate about this. These things are just mental constructs. Yeah. These are, they're nothing except they create polarization. We see the sort of problems people have, and they try to interpret them through one of these lenses. Yeah. And you think uh, yeah. And those the actual problems. Those extremes aren't very healthy, are they? And I guess I look at it another way. It's one, if I want to help my students who are poor, and I have poor mentees from working class backgrounds, it yeah. helps them if I teach them this money mindset stuff. Completely. Really, like, I want to get them out of poverty. It's part of yeah. that. It's not the only thing, but it's part yeah. of that. You know, they need good education, maybe government mm-hmm. investment, you know, small business loans, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. But then the other thing I go is, well, what do I want to take responsibility for? I don't know if there is a better alternative to the capitalist system. There might well be. I hope there is. Maybe there yeah. is. You know, there's problems there. There's definitely. Yeah. But also it's like, is that my responsibility to take that on my shoulders? Or is it just my responsibility to do the best I can with embodiment, which is my skill and my love? And if I want to help more people, I mean, we're in a, today we gave out free uh, embodied trauma training to several thousand people who are working with like anti-racism and anti-discrimination. Yeah. I can only yeah. do that from a place of having a bit of wealth. Oh, yeah. It cost me a few thousand pounds to put that event on. Yeah. If I really want to help people, there's no way I can do that without having at least some money. And that's, and that's the best demonstration of you taking your power back and control and doing something of good. Because what we do is that we've had, um, in one of the businesses, we rent properties. And we've got flats in the poorest area of Derby. So we've got tenants there who are kind of, who are on benefits. And what we what we decided to do over a decade ago is we provided them with free central heating. Because they have problems managing their money, but we see that has like something of a giving of what we value, because there's a yeah. need for that. So you can do more, you can be more of yourself and do more good out there by being good with money rather than looking at the system. That's right. Yeah. And and the, these guys, most of them, they'd they'd actually just drink instead of, you know, but spending it on heating. And we we can tell we've prolonged their lives through being able to give free heating. And that's something we're able to do. 
Yeah, um, yeah. If we you're weren't in a position of being able to give, aren't you? Your position yeah. of being able to give. Yeah. And I think it's very easy. If there's, a, you know, the whole we could look. We haven't really got time now, but we could look at the other side of things of resentment. The amount of resentment I've drawn since I started doing a bit better. You know, even though from an Irish immigrant family yeah. grew up yeah. or alcoholic dad, fuck it out. People yeah. get resentful real quick when oh, you do yeah. well. That's what yeah. I found. And, yeah. you know, that, and I, don't, I don't want to be like a rapper calling everyone a hater who disagrees with them, but there's something in there just going, you know what, I'm not going to, you know, I, you know, Nietzsche identified this, the resentment, the resentment that kind of comes in against the rich and um, or even people who are just moderately successful in embodiment, yeah. not millionaires or anything. What other skill sets were there then? I mean, you got through a few, but what were some of the other skill sets that people need to learn who are, might be listening to this? I think we've identified five critical money skills. Uh-huh. Yeah. To... Um, and this is, again, some of the, the stuff from the training and capability and competency background. There are five critical skills. And one of the first ones is managing money. The second one is saving. And there are specific skills to saving money. Okay. The next one is creating. And then, of course, there is a skill to giving and there is a skill to spending. Yeah. And they're important not- as well, right? Like being out of give, you know, like if you look at the stereotype of like Gollum, yeah, yeah, my friend. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the opposite of that, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And not rescuing. Do you know what I mean? Because you've crossed yeah, yeah, yeah. the line and we've seen loads of people who financially enable people that they should never enable. financially enable. Yeah, well, I've seen that with, you know, you people that have alcoholic husbands or wives or whatever, you know, addiction cycling, they're, yeah. they're just keeping it going, you know, they're not actually helping. So, yeah, yeah enabling would be another one, wouldn't it? So those skills, right. so there's giving, there's being able to ask for money, right? Like one of, a lot of my students really struggle with being able to ask for like payment. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. advice would you have? Because I know a lot of people, like they do yoga, they love their yoga class. Yeah. Or, but then when it comes to asking for the money, they, they somehow they tighten up, they, they yeah. stop breathing. You know, what would you, would yeah. you say there? And I mean, this is very, this is, you embody these things about not deserving and all of these things. But some of it is also, you know, when people are in the space where they stay self-employed and they're not understanding how to build assets in the business. Um, so they're not really understanding how do you pitch your value? Right. And, and and there's a lot of things surrounding that, that when we work with people and say, look, you need to understand what value you're giving. It's not about, you know, whether it's five, 10, 200 or whatever you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's a key one, I think, with marketing generally is often my students will be trying to sell themselves and they'll say, well, I'll come to my yoga because it's Iyengar yoga. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what are you giving? Like, what's the actual value your class provides? And then there's a sort of empathic reframe that's needed from the customer's point of view. And that's like, and that, that's really an empathic move, is seeing what's at the heart of what they offer and the, the actual value of it, rather than, right. well, I do a yoga class, and it's like, well, so what, you know? It's so true, Mark. Mm-hmm. And the being able to then package it in a way that people out there are not just... I suppose, especially the yoga people, but maybe some of the more general population can understand the value as well. Right, right, because it's you know, we tend to speak in our own languages and our own yeah. jargons, and we're all a bit too close to our own businesses. I find it very helpful yeah. to work with advisors, and I'll, I'll go to Julia Shanfrey, one of my advisors in Brighton, or Tad Hargrave, and I say, "Well, what do you think the embodiment conference is, and what am I, what, what am I really selling?" Is one of the yeah. things I ask quite well, a lot. Well, it sounds like a dumb question. But I'm trying to figure out the real, like, what is the the heart of this, the essence of it, the value of this for other people? And sometimes we're a little bit close to our own businesses. We're like, well, I just do Aikido, I just do yoga. I don't necessarily see that from the customer's point of view. That's very powerful. And the really powerful question there, Mark, is what is your customer actually buying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll say it's a yoga class, but it's like, well, what do they get from the yoga class? That's right. Well, they're more relaxed. Okay, well, why is that good that they're more relaxed? Because they don't shout at their kids. Okay, why is that good? Okay, because they have a relationship with their their kids, right? So you have to keep digging, then you're a little bit. Yeah, that's right. Nice. Oh, we're almost on time here. This has been amazing. You guys are absolutely crapping value on everyone. Top takeaways for people then, having heard this. We'll give, uh, so if we give you one each, top takeaways for anyone listening. Mm -hmm. Well, we said the first one's always uncover your mind, uh, your underlying mindset. You can see it from the numbers. Numbers never lie. 
they'll show you your patterns and that's an art in itself because yeah. we have to help people with yeah. that. It's not as easy as you think. And Karen, Malia? And I would say you can you can only take the next step and the next step is fine as long as you're taking the right next step. So that might be someone that's in a debt mindset, just getting mm. that sort of breaking yeah. mindset. Yeah. Is it common? Like, I think I jump about a little bit. Is that common or do you think it's more that we just have one that's there all the time? We do tend to have a default one mm. that is there sort of 60, 70%. It, it, it's the most prevalent. And we shift that when stuff comes into our awareness. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Once is- it comes up into the awareness... And that comes from from the out embodied space. Yeah. Left us, yeah. Okay, if people want to find out more, where do they go? I definitely want to find out more. Is there a book? Is there a website? Yeah. What what's the thing yeah. people do? Our book, The Four Money Mindsets. Okay. Is a very good start. Is it an audio book as well? I love audio books. You've done the audio book yet? It's, we've not done the audio oh, yet. Oh, that's yeah, the next thing yeah. on the list, yeah. Mine too. I haven't done my audio one either. This year I spoke yeah. to someone this morning. That's on my plan for this year. Okay, so there's the book. Any, any um, website? Where was the URL? And the, the, the it's the www.theformoneymindsets.com. There we go. You've got the, yeah. got the URL. And, and great if somebody wants to connect with us on Facebook. It's an unusual surname, Sutton Johal, S-U-T-T-O-N hyphen Johal. And our business page there is The Penny Drops. The penny drops is what people yeah. should be looking for. I'm yeah. just getting some stuff yeah. up on my phone here. Now, by the way, listeners, if ever, listeners ever see me tapping my phone, I'm taking notes, okay? Yeah. Those of you who are on YouTube, and I want you to think I'm uh, texting my mum, which I do need to do today, actually. Okay, final parting message at all from either of you. Final parting message. And this is the thing with uh, actually sorting out your money and creating assets. It's all teachable. It's absolutely doable. We've done it for people. Done it for ourselves. You can learn it, can't you? You can learn it. I think I modelled it the hard way from sort of wealthier friends and saw some of my own patterns and I, you know, stumbled along the way. But I think I could have learned a lot quicker had I had help from people like you. And I still got a way to go. I think there's always a next step. So um, good stuff. I think you've probably pissed off some people. So. Um, Unlucky guys, if you want to send me your complaints on fifty pound notes, that's fine. Just post <laughs> okay. And um, for everybody else, I think you've helped them. So um, thank you so much, both of you. Oh, thank you, Mark. It's great. Thank you for inviting us. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. This comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course is our newsletter list if you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there okay so I think they're the main ones tell your friends pay us some money on Patreon give us a review on iTunes uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Mm-hmm.